Hello, I'm Kimberly Acosta. Welcome to the Native News Update. It's Tuesday, December 7th, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at our website, IndianCountryNews.com. Curtis Bunnell appeared twice in court on December 6th. He who faces a charge of first-degree murder against his cousin Hillary Bunnell has heard that his trial related to the charge will start in late May of 2011. Hillary Bunnell went missing from the Burnt Church First Nation on September 5th of 2009. Her body was found late November of 2009 in the wooded area near Turkati, Sheila. Curtis Bunnell also appeared in court this week in his, for his trial on charges relating to an alleged 2009 sexual assault of a teenage girl. Longtime Grove teacher Lona Hampton has been named the Oklahoma Indian Educator of the Year by the Oklahoma Council of Indian Education. Joan Spade, who has worked in Indian education for more than 20 years at Grove, was named the Elder of the Year. Both recently were honored at the Council's Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hampton, who is of Cherokee and Blackfeet descent, serves as a Native American culture teacher at Grove Middle School and also teaches Cherokee language and culture. Spade serves as Grove's bilingual cultural resource specialist and tutor. She's a full blood Cherokee who works to teach students the Indian way. And today we continue our conversation with Paul Demain on the murder trial of Anime Aquash. We're here with Paul, and he's in Rapid City, South Dakota, covering the trial for John Graham. You want to give us the update for today of what happened yesterday afternoon and this morning? Some of the things that happened yesterday afternoon is, is that as uh, John Murphy was questioning Kamuk Nichols yesterday, uh, the issue of Ray Robinson came up, and it came up in the context of the American Indian Movement eliminating uh, previous informants. And so Ray Robinson's involvement into coming into Wounded Knee and disappearing there uh, was raised. It wasn't raised in depth. Uh, the more interesting thing that occurred yesterday afternoon as we returned to the courtroom was that they held a competency hearing for Theta Nelson Clark, uh, who they did bring in uh, by wheelchair along with her attorney and some affidavits having to do with their uh, medical treatment. Now, she's been reported in the past to be, uh, you know, gambling and, and, and able to comprehend major things at times when she wants to, um, it, it's questionable. I mean, if the, when this indictment took place in the year 2001 and the trial in 2004 of Arla Looking Cloud, Theta Nelson Clark might have been much more capable, but it was obvious that her uh, physical capabilities has, have certainly diminished. She's apparently had some strokes and uh, struggled it. However, the judge had a good conversation with her. And they discussed when she graduated from high school and what school she went to and, and, and details of many things. In fact, corrected him at some times about some of the things he was saying. He ruled her competent. And at that particular point when uh, Marty uh, Jackley, uh, uh, I believe, was describing to her about whether she intended to testify truthfully to the next series of questions uh, she basically looked her attorney and asked him, well, what am I supposed to tell this guy? And the attorney at that particular point entered a plea of the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. Now, this took place outside of the purview of the jury, but it was there for uh, both all the people in the audience and uh and, and the writers and journalists to see. So she was certified as competent. She pled the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination, and she was wheeled back out of the courtroom. Can we go back for a moment, and can you tell everyone who Ray Robinson was? Ray Robinson was a black civil rights worker who worked with Martin Luther King and An Andrew Young and many of that group in the 1960s in the Deep South. In 1973, he went to Wounded Knee uh, in order to support them and to consult with them. Uh, he apparently got in several arguments. He was assigned to a bunker. They tried to get him to shoot a gun at Marshalls during the firefights. He refused to pick up the gun. He was identified or fingered as a potential informant. He was uh, shot uh, in a confrontation that involved David Hill, Dennis Banks, uh, Carter Camp, and Leonard Crow Dog, and some of the other AIM security members there, and uh, was apparently then later uh, you know, passed away or died. He was never seen again. Uh, the information we have is that he was laid out in front of uh, Dennis Banks' uh, house at Wounded Knee, the, the house that Dennis Banks was staying in uh, before Floyd Westerman's uh, younger brother, Chris Westerman, and some other AIM people took him out and buried him. So he, his remains are apparently still out at Wounded Knee as we speak. 
And then Arlo Looking Cloud took the stand yesterday and continued today? Arlo Looking Cloud took the stand. Uh, of course, his answers are very short and contrite in, in most of it, yes and no, in terms of the prosecution side. On the defense side, uh, Murphy hammered away at him uh, about the discrepancies in the many statements he's made over the years. Uh, there's uh, uh, a dozen documents, some of them a half foot high in terms of testimony and recordings and what he said. And so Murphy basically pointed out that uh, Arlo Looking Cloud has a lengthy a criminal record, that he knows how to swing deals, that he's lied to police officers, and that many of these statements are consistent with being inconsistent. This morning, uh, when we resumed, uh, Murphy finished up with that same line. Basically, uh, Arlo is a very agreeable person, agreed to a lot of the things that Murphy said. In fact, you know, the government was unpleased with your story, so when you started telling him this, the government was pleased with what you were telling him, and Arlo would answer, yes. Uh, what's interesting is, is that uh, when the prosecution came back on re-examination, essentially they talked about a certain number of things. And that was is that uh, who, who did you tell the prosecutor, uh, you know, this law enforcement official was at Wombly when uh, Anna Mae was shot. Uh, and it was John Graham. And in this document, in this affidavit, so they were able to show that over the years, despite changes in the 72-hour scenario that Arlo has been consistent in saying that John Graham was present when Anna Mae was shot, and he's been consistent in saying that John Graham shot Anna Mae. Now, there's all kinds of other edges to what he has said over the years, but there is some very intentional and, and very striking uh, consistency to what he said about John Graham's involvement in it. And I think the prosecution is attempting to show that John Graham was there, that Arlo's been consistent over the years saying that John Graham was there and shot Adam May. But there's a lot of other things that have changed over time based on his memory and other things. He didn't speak English until he was uh, seven or eight years old. Uh, he's not a good reader. He's not real articulate. He's not a public person. So it's been a little bit difficult on the stand. And you can see that. The jury will have to decide whether he's credible at this point or is at least credible in those particular points the prosecution pointed out or that he's simply a liar looking for a deal. But he's currently serving life for his involvement in the Aquash murder. So is there any deal he can even get? Well, there's no deal that's been offered up. Essentially, uh, if he testifies, there's a couple things. Number one, he's got parole under 1975 murder in the federal court system. You're eligible for parole after 10 years. He's coming up for parole in another couple of years. There's something called, I think, an I-35 format in which you can go back in front of a judge and ask for a reduction. But essentially, he signed a document. Uh, offering further evidence in here before he ever talked to any prosecutors. He uh, basically discussed some things with his attorney. It was a South Dakota attorney at the time. The attorney approached the U.S. government and says, I think my client has some additional information. He signed a document says there's no deal being offered whatsoever at this particular point. They're going to have to see what he does. If he cooperates, they perhaps could write a letter that's positive to him, either for a sentence reduction or a parole. But essentially, there is no, no deal until uh, they see exactly what happens in these cases. And then Denise, Anime's daughter, she testified today? Uh, yes, following Arlo uh, Looking Cloud, Denise uh, testified that uh, Arlo Looking Cloud had called him in the year, I believe, 2001, prior to his indictment. Um, I, I don't have the date. I'm looking for the date uh, right here now. But essentially, she said that Arlo did call Debbie and Denise. They asked about whether he, they could record him. He said he preferred not to, and they respected that. Uh, they said that time stood still for the first time in 30 some years and that Arlo had said he was calling them because he thought that they deserved to know what had happened to their mother, that he be he became emotional during parts of the phone call, but that he was consistent in, in what he's been saying now in regards to, because he didn't talk a lot about all the things in Denver, Colorado and Rapid City, South Dakota. Essentially, he says, we took her to Wombly, John Graham and Theta Nelson Clark walked uh, her out of the car. He got out of the car and stood by the car. They took her over the hill. He heard a gunshot and they came back and anime was not uh, with them any longer. And consistent about the fact that his claim uh, that it was John Graham 
in this case, it could be John Graham or Theta at, the, at that site, but John Graham is with Theta, one or the other, that he wasn't with, uh, with them. He has testified previously and in, in, in the day uh, during his testimony that he actually observed John Graham seeing uh, him shoot their mother. So again, some inconsistencies in what he said, but consistent in the fact that he places John Graham and Theta and himself at the place where she was executed. Uh, and Denise noted that uh, John Graham did never call them. Uh, he claims to be uh, their mother's friend. And neither did any other member of the American Indian Movement in 35 years contact Debbie or Deese, Denise or their family that Arlo was the only one that ever called and that he did show remorse for what he was telling her and said that he didn't know. He says he didn't know. He thought they were just going to uh, scare her. He just said he didn't think that they were actually going to follow through and execute her. And did he say anything about the gun, being that Dick Marshall has denied that he gave them the gun? Uh, Dick Marshall has denied that he even went back in the bedroom, even though Cleo Gates testified that uh, Dick Marshall, her ex-husband, and Arlo Looking Cloud and Jan... John Graham and Theda Nelson Clark all went in the back bedroom. I know federal authorities are going to look at that very deeply to see the inconsistency because Marshall verified or certified that his wife was a much ex-wife was a much better uh, witness and had a better recollection of what happened. But uh, basically, our little cloud says that it was Dick Marshall that provided the gun when they went back in that bedroom that he got the shells and the gun out of a dresser drawer and uh, provided them to Theda Nelson Clark. So, yes, he did. Okay. And was there anything else that Denise had to te testify on today? Uh, it wasn't very lengthy testimony, no. It was basically on that phone call that was in the year 2001. Uh, from what I got, Arlo's call was actually in the year 2002. But remember, that was two years before he was, uh, you know, it was before he was indicted. It was before he was on trial. It was before he was trying to make a deal. He's actually showing remorse and confessing to people about his involvement. And uh, then, you know, like I says, Denise says basically he was the only one from the American Indian Movement that had ever contacted the family uh, about this, despite the fact that many Indian people to be claimed to be close friends of Anime Pictouakwash and their mother. Uh, following up on the end today, real quickly, is uh, Robert Ekafi is now on the stand. He's talking about a uh, trip he took to uh, Whitehorse, Canada, and Yukon Territory uh, in 1994. Of April in which uh, he met with John Graham and uh, during their first encounter that John Graham started shaking so badly that he was trying to light a cigarette and he was shaking like this and couldn't couldn't light the cigarette they lined up a meeting that afternoon uh, which he didn't show up to but uh, later that evening they got together and Graham did show up at a park and we're at that point right now where Robert Ekafri is describing his meeting and discussion with John Boy Pat Graham in Yukon Territory, Vancouver, on April 20th, 1994. And can you tell us a little bit about the jur who, who's on the jury before we go for the day? Uh, we've got seven uh, uh, women on this jury. Uh, it's an older jury, jury than the Marshall trial. Uh, and at this particular point, uh, there is one African-American on it. And I've been told that they thought there were two enrolled uh, tribal members on that jury as well. Remember, there's 14 of them. They've got two extra just in case someone gets sick or has to drop out for some reason. Uh, they're attentive. They're writing notes. Uh, they've got a lot to take in. Uh, but it's uh, but it's a it's a it's a diverse jury. And how much longer do you think the trial is going to go on? I think the prosecution might be able to rest this afternoon if they can get through all the uh, motions and objections. Again, they've dealt with a lot of techni technicalities. There's been there was technicalities in Canada for extraditing Graham. There's been almost what six years of. Uh, of uh, litigation and technicalities in terms of motions and all kinds of jurisdictional issues and now the same thing in court. Lots of objections, lots of technicalities that are being thrown up in the way of some of the evidence and testimony that the prosecution is trying to submit. Well, thank you, Paul, and we'll catch up with you again tomorrow. Thank you much, Kim. And that's the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.